Before we move on, I would once again like to remind you that we are going to be having in our presence four Grammy Award winners amongst us who will also be giving us an unforgettable performance tonight. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from religion to politics to economics, we've had a range of diverse conversations on issues that matter. In fact, one such burning hot topic was India versus Bharat. It was a political controversy that stirred the dynamics of a nation's name. So Bharat, as the successor state to the Indic civilization, has remained a fascinating idea of research and debate, more so in recent history when Bharatiyas have begun to undertake a critical decolonial study of Bharat's history, especially in the context of the very important constitution. So that, ladies and gentlemen, religiosity towards the document is moderated by a sense of proportion, perspective, and most importantly, purpose. Our next session is with a very distinguished person on decoding Bharatiya and Bharatiyata. Please welcome Jai Sai Deepak, lawyer and author, and also Anas Jamir, who is the advocate with the Supreme Court, along with CNN News 18's Rahul Shiv Shankar. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a nice huge round of applause. We've just come back from tea. Let's have some enthusiasm. Rahul, thank you so much. Welcome, Jai Sai Deepak, Mr. Tanveer. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. The buzzword is Bharat. Bharat, that is India. The Prime Minister has already outlined the ideological governance and cultural contours of the transition to Bharatiyata. So let's decode Bharatiya and Bharatiyata with these two fine gentlemen on the stage with me. Let me first begin with you, Jay Sai Deepak. You've written a number of books. In fact, uh, you're coming out with a third in a series. What values define a Bharatiya for you? So one, I think the question that is usually asked is whether this is a religious construct or a civilization construct or a cultural construct. I think if you go by the words of Sri Sarvepali Radhakrishnan and Swami Vivekananda, it's impossible to take religion out of Bharatiya life. And I think a lot of people have tried but have failed to remove religion uh, from even politics for that matter. Whether that's for the good or the bad, that I think posterity will decide. But it's a statement of fact, it exists. So I believe that religion and culture go hand in hand in informing the civilizational identity of this land, which is Bharat. But the problem is, if you were to treat this as a construct which is meant to exclude certain populations from the tapestry of Bharat's identity, well, that's not the purpose of it. When you try and reclaim your identity, you're merely saying, this is who I am, and I'm happy to accommodate everybody else who does not have an antithetical relationship with this identity. So as far as I'm concerned, both Hindu dharma, along with civilizational aspects, uh, which, are, which are part of, let's say, Hindu cultural mainstream, define what is Bharatiyata. During the course of the drafting of the constitution, one of the questions that was asked is that when public morality is sought to be defined and its contours are sought to be understood in the context of Bharat, what is the repository or the reservoir from which we draw those values? To which several members of the constant assembly took the categorical position that dharma is the public morality of Bharat. So if you were to ask me what is the defining trait which defines Bharatiyata, then you start and end with dharma. Now, unfortunately, since English is a language which is incapable of providing a decent translation for dharma, it is typically and crudely and incorrectly translated or approximated to religion, which it is not. It's more a code of conduct, but it also has a certain set of principles which clearly trace their origins to the Hindu faith system or the agglomeration of Hindu faith system, so to speak. So for me, in that sense, the civilizational identity of Bharat is significantly and primarily informed by Hindu dharma. But precisely because it's defined by Hindu dharma, it is capable of accommodating others who do not pose a threat to its very existence. Mr. Anas, 
let's build on this opening by JSI Deepak. The RSS and other spokespeople expect citizens from other denominations to describe themselves as Hindus. Dharma is, of course, identified very closely with Hinduness, they say. Which they say is a function of Bharatiyata. Now, how does one apply it in the context of a multi-religious society such as ours? Uh, see, my understanding of Bharatiyata, or dharm even for that matter, has always been what I was taught as a kid in the school, anekta mein ekta. We are the country, we are very proud of this thing, that we are different from each other, different from each other, different from each other, जाति के हैं, अलग दिखते हैं, अलग ज़बान के हैं, लेकिन हम एक थे, एक झंडा था हमारा, एक देश था हमारा, उसको हम सलाम कर रहे थे, और मेरे लिए बस वही था एक धर्म का मामला। अब जैसा ही दीपक ने कहा कि हिंदू धर्म डिफाइन करता है, धर्म की भारतीयता क्या है, क्या है, मैं इससे थोड़ा अलग मत रखता हूँ ये कहना है कि जब 1950 में हमने संविधान अपनाया, तो हमने इस मुल्क को एक डिसाइड किया कि हम ऐसे देखते हैं, ये ऐसा होगा, एक सेक्युलर देश होगा, इस ऐसा देश होगा जहाँ सब बराबर होंगे, जहाँ सबके पास समान अधिकार होंगे। आज जब आप नागरिकता पे और मैं ये नहीं कहता हूँ कि जैसे एक बहुत ज़्यादा प्रेवलेंट आर्गुमेंट है आर्टिकल 14 को लेके मैं वो आर्गुमेंट ही नहीं लेता हूँ मैं मानता हूँ कि हाँ आर्गुमेंट आर्टिकल 14 से इंडियंस के लिए है सिर्फ सिटिजेंस के लिए मैं वो नहीं कहता हूँ लेकिन जब आप पूरा उसका बेस बना देते हैं धर्म को तो आपको ये देखना पड़ेगा कि डेमोक्रेसी जो खुद अपने आप में एक वेस्टर्न कंस्ट्रक्ट है लेकिन हम उसको लेके चल रहे हैं और इतने उस पर गर्व कर रहे हैं उसमें कि कौन से और ऐसा डेमोक्रेटिक या सेक्युलर देश है जहाँ पे धर्म के बेसिस पे सिटिजनशिप दी जा रही है और सिटिजनशिप एक वो राइट है जो आप वापस नहीं छीन सकते हो एक बार आप दे देते हो तो छीन नहीं सकते हो तो हमें किसको दे रहे हैं कैसे दे रहे हैं इस पे विचार करने की बहुत ज़्यादा आवश्यकता है सो दिस इज इंटरेस्टिंग बिकॉज हिज डेफिनेशन ऑफ भारतीयता इज यूनिटी इन डाइवर्सिटी डिराइव फ्रॉम दैट now, you know, with the government that is identified with Hindutva, many are wary of, you know, outcomes such as these. I think he's referring, without naming CA. it, to the CA. Correct. So how does one now reconcile the objectives of the CAA with the larger construct of the, civilization, of the Constitution as it stands? See, interestingly, both of us are just coming back from the Chief Justice's court. <laughs> That's why both of us are trying to, let's say, channel those arguments. So you didn't finish your arguments no, there? No, it's you listed for April May, in fact. <laughs> we, we, we so we are on the opposite side in that matter. So I don't see why this has got to do with CA. But in any case, I'll try and address this. Just so that uh, I answer your question to him in a slightly different fashion, I disagree with the RSS definition of Hinduism and Hindutva completely. At least on their attempts to say that everybody who is born in this country is a Hindu. I don't think that needs to be said. I don't think someone who is a Muslim or a Christian uh, needs to be expected to embrace the definition of Hindu in that sense because there are two problems with that approach. One, it dilutes the definition of Hindu dharma for the followers of dharma themselves. And second, it foists that concept on those who are not followers of the dharma in that sense. You don't need to do that. According to me, good fences make good neighbors, period. You don't need to actually start this interfaith dialogue and look for equality and let's say similarity and everything. That is not even necessary. The point is very simple. When you speak of unity and diversity, Bharat traces that very value precisely from Hindu dharma because Hindu dharma is ultimately an agglomeration of multiple faith systems within itself. Several denominations subscribe to those points of view which may not actually find a point of convergence in that particular sense. The Vaishnavite may ultimately see Vishnu as the supreme being. The Shaivite may ultimately see Shiva as the supreme being. The Shakta might see Shakti as the supreme being or Devi as the supreme being. For each of them, you can think of them as monotheism in silos, but it's a polytheistic pantheon in that particular sense. So unity and diversity as far as Bharat is concerned cannot have learned it from anybody else except Hindu dharma at least in the history of the subcontinent, so to speak. So on that, I don't think there is a difference of view between Mr. Tanvir and me. There is a clear difference of view in the attempts on the part of, let's say, certain sections of certain cultural organizations to dilute the definition. Now, should we go to the argument of the CAA? 
I will just limit it to this because ultimately this matter has to be contested before the court of law, the Chief Justice's court on April 9th, which is the next date. The point is, I don't think that piece of legislation is meant to threaten anybody who lives here as a legitimate citizen of the country, regardless of their faith. Two, I don't think the definition of CAA or the way it is, or the way it is being included as a, as a humanitarian intervention as part of the Citizenship Act has anything to do with the topic here. So let me stick to the topic here. The point is, Bharatiyata ultimately means that your points of loyalty, your points of allegiance are not extraterritorial and that you choose loyalty to Bharat more than anything else. Now that is easy as far as adherence of Hindu dharma is concerned simply because their sacred spaces are here. But if you happen to follow a certain faith system, I'm not saying that it is impossible for a non-Hindu to be loyal to Bharat. I don't think that statement can be made at all in light of the kind of examples that we have had right from Sri Arif Muhammad Khan of today to Abdul Kalam of, of the past. So I don't think those examples are valid. Those who are able to reconcile their faith, which have emanated from other parts of the world, and their loyalty to Bharat, according to me, are fully capable of subscribing to the concept of Bharatiyata. I am not going to use religion as the sole and the primary filter to exclude people from the pale of Bharatiyata. I'm saying those who are able to strike that balance will obviously fall within the definition. Those who think that their personal identity from a religious point of view is at loggerheads with Bharatiyata would have made the decision anyways. I'm just hoping that since we are told that there is an Indian brand of certain foreign systems or foreign faith systems, there truly exists such Indian brands which is different from the brands that is followed in our immediate neighborhood. That's all I can say. But this concept of, let's say, let's flip the word, diversity and unity. How does the CA take that forward? I know that you want to sort of disconnect the conversation yeah, from yeah, Bharatiyata, but this government claims that it is actually the one that speaks for a the essence of Bharatiyata, right. and it talks about a Hinduness, right. which it traces to right. a dharmic past. But if that CA is going to be, or the dharma is going to sort of, at some level or the other, bring out an exposition like the CA, then we have a problem. So, see, let's have this conversation on the anvils of specifics. Is there any amendment to the existing Citizenship Act which precludes the possibility of non-Hindu applicants to knock at the doors of Bharat for citizenship or asylum? The answer is a no. The CAA is a limited inclusive intervention for the purposes of addressing the unfortunate realities of our immediate neighborhood, where three Islamic republics have a specific problem with other identities. That's the unfortunate reality. And we are operating under the premise that Indian Islam is different from the brands of Islam being subscribed to by our neighbors. Okay? Therefore, those people who are getting the rough end of the stick, thanks to their minority position in those countries, are being given a certain expedited option. Because the first point of attack when it comes to these countries happens to be those people who do not share the faith of the majority in those countries. Therefore, since they are the first points of attack, they are the softest targets possible, a limited intervention is being made. The myth that is being purveyed is that CAA translates to automatic vestation of citizenship. It doesn't, because they still have to satisfy the rules that have been notified. Second, all it does is that it limits a certain cutoff period from 11 years to 6 years. Two, my own criticism of the CAA, despite me supporting it in principle, is the cutoff date that has been prescribed, which ultimately translates to defeating the very humanitarian intention, which is supposed to be the basis for the CAA. What is the point of limiting it to a particular date? Regardless of that, my argument still remains, I welcome it because it doesn't take away anybody else's rights. It only makes sure that those people who are being kicked out are being welcomed as soon as possible. My criticism has also been the delayed notification of the rules. So because I am not the mouthpiece for any cultural or political outfit, I am at some liberty to criticize the proponents of the CAA themselves for the delay that they have caused after taking eight different extensions from the parliament in the notification of the rules themselves. So according to me, it's important to dehyphenate these positions from any political organization or a cultural organization because dare I say this, 
a lot of us are practicing Hindus, not because of a political party or because of a cultural organization, but because we have always been practicing Hindus. Their existence or absence wouldn't have made a difference to our practice in any case. So Anas, then what's the problem? He's saying that, look, it's only fast-tracking, it's not denying. You can still come in if you're Muslims, if you're persecuted in various countries, in any country, you can still come here and seek refuge. See, to that extent, he's right. I'm, I'm also not denying that. It's not even fast-tracking, let me tell you. The purpose stands defeated as of now. Because for, for to, ta to take the advantage of CAA, the cutoff is December 2014, and you have to be in India five years prior, that is 2009. Now that would have fast-tracked to six years instead of 12 years. We are in 2024, 10 years since 2014. It's already redundant. It doesn't help anyone. CAA neither helps anyone, it actually does create problem for those who are left out of NRC in Assam. Only particularly to Assam, it does create problem for them and I will expound on that. But about the rest of the other things that Dharam and uh, saying ki, you know, ek, uh, I don't know if you guys remember there was this series called Panchayat. A very famous dialogue from that ki, dekh raha hai binod, angrezi mein bol bol ke kaisa baat ghuma rahe hai. So this is the same thing, that what was the purpose of the English in English? What was the purpose of the Deepak, my brother, what did he say? That if Hindus will come, then it will be easier to be a Hindu. You are reading the news every day, from Rajasthan, from Lakhnau, from every place, that there are Hindus who are arresting our agencies to give them the same as the ISI. So, to give any religion, to give any religious denomination, you can give a blanket to them, that you are coming. If you are Hindu, then you will be good. This doesn't make any sense of this thing. Okay, oath of allegiance is not all of us, but it doesn't make any sense of this thing. But reasonable classifications have been used... Reasonable classification... ...by many countries... Let's talk about Hindu. What about the Tamil Hindus from Sri Lanka? What about the Buddhists from China and other places? For example, I mean, wherever... So, why did you leave them? If you didn't take them, and I understand that you have different policies for Tamils, you have given them that, but you didn't give citizenship to them. You gave them refugees, you didn't give citizenship. So, you didn't do anything with Hindu, you didn't do anything with them. The other thing, I said, there is no quarrel with me. It doesn't affect me, it doesn't affect me at all. My citizenship is safe and secure. But in Assam, there are 19.4 million people who are living in Assam. They can apply for naturalization. But now, if the CA is under the CA, then they can apply for naturalization. I don't want to say that they can apply for CA, but if they can apply for 2 million people in Assam, they can apply for 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 indigenous, they can apply for Assam. Do they prove themselves first in Bangladesh? For the sake of Hindustan? It can be very absurd that for Hindustan, for Hindustan, for Hindustan's citizenship, for naturalization, we have to prove it in Bangladesh first. Okay. I'll try and make sense of the garbled argument presented here and see if I can unpack a few layers from the argument. Garbled argument. Yes. Okay. So first, see here's the point. Yeah. Ever since the end of the LTTE, the situation has normalized to such an extent that Tamil Sri Lankans, are not being forced to flee that country, that is a fact. The fact of the matter is, if Bharat had an equation or at least the ability to pressurize Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan to the extent that they could treat their Hindu minorities with some degree of dignity, then the CAA would actually be irrelevant and unnecessary. Because ultimately, it's a question of what is your relationship with those countries, what is the treatment of those populations by their native governments. Today, nobody can accuse the Sri Lankan government of meeting out the same treatment to Tamil Sri Lankans the way Hindus of Pakistan are being given treatment by Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Afghanistan, so to speak, in those countries. So if you can ensure that they can stay in their own countries without creating any further trouble for themselves or for us, we would want them to stay there. So therefore, the entire argument is this, that Bharat must effectively apply an open dharamshala policy in the name of the CAA, and the CAA is unconstitutional precisely because it doesn't open its doors to every persecuted community under the sun. Frankly speaking, this makes a mockery of the concept of sovereignty 
and our own borders and our own sovereign interest and security interest. I have no reason to trust a Muslim from Pakistan, Afghanistan or Bangladesh, period. Because ultimately a choice was made and therefore I will certainly view them with a certain degree of suspicion, a heightened degree of suspicion compared to people coming from the Hindu community in those states. That's a but fact. But the Hindus There's in Pakistan a... stayed back in no, Pakistan. Here's, here's the funny part. The Hindus here's in the Pakistan stayed back their in Pakistan. Argument is, their entire <laughs> argument is, the Hindus of Pakistan stayed back. Why? Here's the point. When Pakistan was created, the question was, how do we divide land for this area called Pakistan? So the existing population of Muslims in this country in undivided Bharat was taken into account based on the 1946 elections and then the area was divided. Despite 90% of the population of Muslim community before 1946 voting for the state of Pakistan, the bulk of them stayed that's, back. That's wrong. That's a fact. It's a fact. It's, it's a documented a fact. fact. You don't fact. get to actually deny these facts. It is out of so context. Today we are being it, told, it loses in we are being told everybody who stayed back, stayed back for purposes of patriotism. Sorry, 1946 elections proved whose allegiance were where. Secondly, here's the important thing. The Hindus of so you're talking about the 1946 yes, elections saying, and the results back there? in the Muslim provinces yes. where a large number of Muslims yes. voted for I'll no. it's like this. Muslim Assume for a moment, you yeah. have a six bedroom house. Yes. Out of that one portion of the family says, we are X number of people, we need 50% of the house. Ultimately, only two people shift to that portion of the, fam that portion of the house which has been given for 50% of the family. The rest of them stay back. Now, because we are constantly told that Dr. Ambedkar is the framer of the constitution, and we are expected to constantly count out to him. Why would Dr. Ambedkar speak of a complete exchange of populations after 1946 and after the elections if he wasn't aware of the ground reality when he was actually part of the drafting committee of the constitution? So why is it that Ambedkar is selectively quoted and cited in other contexts? Why don't we quote him in this context? What did he say in his book, Pakistan and the Partition of Bharat? What did he say with respect to the reasons for population change? Why did he actually bat so vociferously for population exchange more than even Madan Mohan Malvi for that matter? Madan Mohan Malvi is the founder of the Banaras Hindu University in 1916. These are all people who were participants in the Sangathan movement. The one who openly wrote a book asking for exchange of the Muslim population of Bharat with the Hindu population of undivided Pakistan, so to speak, was Dr. Ambedkar. What is their response to that? So if you have a problem with this argument, go ahead, call Dr. Ambedkar and Islamophobe. We'll see what happens after that. No, no, I, I will not do that. I will not do that. Well, no, but the, anyway, caste is a but Western construct, my friend said earlier. Fundamentally, there was a whole movement, as you know. I, I, let I, me put nuance to what he said. No, they'll who, blame who, the two-nation theory let on Savarkar and they'll leave like, Sayyadah Mathkan out of the picture. Okay. That's okay. the See, when, when a man right, loses patience to okay. listen, I know I have yeah, one. Yeah, make yeah. Okay. Of course you have one. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> First of all, see, this is what I learned during my days in debating. If a man attacks, see, this is the problem. This is the problem. We started with Bhatiyata. We started with dharma. It ended up coming to Muslim from Pakistan. Like every single time. Is that dharma? What about your own existence? Why are you not proud of that? I come from Banaras. Sanskrit, uh, Sankat Mochan Mandir ke pangar mein khela hu mein. मैं मुसलमान हूँ, मैं पांच वक्त का नमाजी हूँ, मैं सब रोज़े से हूँ। ज्ञान वापी वापस दे दीजिए। ठीक है, लेकिन मैं वो भारत को रिप्रेजेंट करता हूँ। ज्ञान वापी वापस दे दीजिए। ज्ञान वापी वापस दे दीजिए। ज्ञान वापी वापस दे दीजिए। ज्ञान वापी पे चल रहा है। मतलब वापस दे दीजिए। अरे � 40,000 places, give it all back. Dekhi, I'm sure Banaras will have made it. Yeah, 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 80 percent कहाँ आई कौन deny this it's not 80 percent आपने ज़मीदा आपने 100 लोगों में 100 लोगों की जनसंख्या में से 10 को दिया वोट का अधिकार वो 10 थे ज़मीदार जिनको मिला जिनको कहते हैं कि अलीगढ़ के बच्चों की लॉन्डो की बदतमीजी है पाकिस्तान हमेशा ये कहा जाता कि अलीगढ़ के लॉन्डो की बदमाशी है ये तो तो ये वही था पाकिस्तान तो अलीगढ़ के लॉन्डो की बदमाशी था उन्हीं को तो आपने अधिकार दिया था वोट का हम जैसे चलो हमारे भी रहा होगा हमारे ठीक ठाक घर से आता हूँ मैं लेकिन बाकी जो गरीब थे वो थे उनको अधिकार नहीं मिला था औरतों का अधिकार नहीं मिला था एक तबके को मिला था वो तबका पाकिस्तान चला गया उसको वहाँ पे बहुत ज़मीन मिली है वो बहुत अमीरी से क्योंकि पाकिस्तान ने तो अपना जमींदारी एबोल्यूशन भी नहीं किया तो इन लोग के पास ज़मीन वमीन है वो वहाँ खुश हैं हम आज तक उनका झेल रहे हैं हमसे तो कोई मतलब ही नहीं था हमारे पास तो वोट था ही नहीं तो अगर वो इतने हम पे उसका इल्जाम क्यों है 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 हम पे उस
And if they now find that the idea is not a good one, in fact, they are getting actually discriminated because of who they are in Pakistan, then it's not our responsibility to rehabilitate this Pakistan's problem. It is not our responsibility for Hindus also. Sovereignty ki baat hoi thi na, apne border ki baat hoi thi. Hindustan ki baat hoti hai, to Hindustan ke logo ki baat hoti hai. Aap citizenship naturalization ka aapke paas pura process tha. Bada saal mein pura hota tha, ek bohat achcha develop kiya tha. Parliament ke paas wo right tha. Parliament paas aaj bhi wo right hai. Bada saal mein milta hai ki aap yaha pe gyaara saal Hindustan mein rahe, ek saal aap pe lagataar rahe, ya to aap Hindustan mein rahe hai, ya Hindustan ke sarkar ki aapne seva ki hai. इसमें क्या बुराई थी? खैर आपने कहा चलो हम एक्सपेडाइट करेंगे एक्सपेडाइट भी नहीं हो रहा है। Respond to that इसमें क्या बुराई थी? बार बार ये सिर्फ हिंदुस्तान ही इस जस्ट सिंग हिंदुस्तान हैज़ नो सिविलाइजेशनल ऑब्लिगेशन टू द हिंदुस ऑफ़ पाकिस्तान। Fair enough, that's what he keeps saying. Twelve times he's just dropped the word हिंदुस्तान। Second, अलीगढ़ के लॉन्डोंग की जो and this is dismissed as Aligarh ke London ki Ayashi. How insensitive to the people have actually done this. Millions mein saare hai. That's the funny part. Millions mein koi ek kaum nahi hai. Here's the funny part. So the point I'm trying to make is, we discuss the obligation that independent Bharat has an obligation towards Hindus and Sikhs living in undivided Pakistan. This discussion happens from 45, 46, 47 because the conversation has already started. After the Lahore resolution and Karachi resolution, it's absolutely clear that Pakistan has become a reality. So then on the questions start getting addressed. The constant assembly starts, it's, it's formulated in August 1946. Subsequently, once the conversation start, we actually keep a few seats open in the hope that Pakistan doesn't become a reality. That is the extent to which we went. When we realized this is not going to happen, we switched the conversation to ask the question, what do we do to those people who are being held hostage? Because the history of this period will show that Pakistan decided to use the non-Muslim population of that particular area as a hostage population to negotiate with Bharat. The entire basis for the nehru liaquat Pact ultimately was this. Let's assume for a moment that we don't owe an obligation to the Hindus of Pakistan and Pakistan doesn't have a duty with respect to Muslims of India. Why did the fount of everything that's great in this country, Sri Japandir Jawaharlal Nehru, choose to enter yes. into a nehru liaquat Pact where both of us are assuring the other with respect to the safety of religious minorities in their country? What is this basis then? Ultimately, at the political level and at the constitutional level, we have accepted that we have a civilizational duty towards these minorities. Anas, this is documented point. fact. That is that's a very valid, valid point. point. Uh, see, I'm, not ho I'm neither holding brief for Nehru, nor I'm no, holding no, brief for Pakistan. Please answer the specific question. Forget but about I, holding I a brief. I completely agree with that. At that point, so Nehru... So we are now executing that civilizational I, brief. No, no, no. Allow me. The civilization... Nehru Liaquat Pact, what did it say? It said that, brother, you do it from your own side. We will do it from our own side. It's going to be going there, it's going to be going there, it's not going to be going there. You can put international forums on pressure. Hindustan is very strong. We have beaten Pakistan very strong, brother. We have beaten Pakistan very strong, brother. आप क्या बात कहते हैं हम हर जंग जीते हैं डिप्लोमेसी में हम उनसे ऊपर हैं हर चीज में हम के विश्वगुरु हैं हम मदर ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी हैं स्पिरिट द स्पिरिट ऑफ द अग्रीमेंट हाँ गेव बोथ द कंट्रीज अ से इन द वेलफेयर ऑफ द रिलिजियस माइनॉरिटीज अक्रॉस ईच अदर्स बॉर्डर्स बिकॉज़ ऑफ़ अनफॉर्च्युनेटली इन of the religious minorities, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Christians, the Agreed. Buddhists, the Jains, and uh, the others. Christians so also. they say, where are the Jews? The there was only one Jew, according to the census of Pakistan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they're saying that Jews are not in question. Jews. That's so, not so, the so point. So here's the point. If you read Articles 5 to 11 of the Constitution, that is entirely Pakistan-centric when you're defining citizenship as part of your own constitution, because you realize that there's a continuing cord that connects you with the people there. It also speaks of how many people can go there when you come back, what happens to your citizenship, so on and so forth. So in the backdrop of your specific history of the subcontinent, considering the basis for the partition, for us to say we owe no obligations whatsoever, despite the nehru liaquat Pact, according to me, is to make an argument in vacuum when there are clear documented facts to the contrary. Look, I get See, the sense. Ma 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 can I ask a provocative question? But I'm very thankful to my friend here. He knows that I'm fasting and I can't speak much, so he's doing the okay, all right. the speaking. Okay, you're not fasting. No, you're not fasting. Hanuman ji is fasting. But he, I'm just, I'm being thankful to you. Why are you getting agitated? I'm just being thankful to you. Don't get so angry. You need not be so angry. We are very angry. What happened? Calm down. It's good. 
अब मैं आता हूँ उस बात पे मैंने कहा मेरा सी ए से कोई कॉलेज नहीं मैंने शुरू में ही कहा था मैं फिर से वापस आ रहा मेरा कॉलेज क्यों होगा थोड़ा सा है वो है अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशनैलिटी पे मैं संविधान को मानता हूँ मैं संविधान के अगर कोई चीज अनुरूप नहीं है कोई कानून तो वो गलत है that a child born in india will be an indian citizen That's if true. either of the parent are indian citizen and the other is not an illegal immigrant i'll wrap it up okay is not an illegal immigrant now place this like this i am a muslim born after 2003 i am an indian citizen my mother is not sure. uh, my mother is an illegal immigrant similarly place there is a hindu kid on the same footing he can take advantage of the That's ca true. i cannot article 15 says there cannot be a discrimination on the basis of race religion caste I'll gender so on and so forth I'll one, answer minute, the one, one, one minute 20 seconds the problem with this argument is that a pakistani hindu refugee who has come through a legitimate refugee channel is being equally equated with a bangladeshi muslim immigrant who has come through the illegal channel as part of this particular I'm definition i'm talking about in, born Therefore, in india when pakistani hindu i'm talking about indians i'm not exactly even talking about pakistani a pakistani hindu refugee and an indian parent so to speak when they combine you're actually it's a marriage between an indian citizen and a an refugee within bharat which is recognized by an indian law but when an illegal migrant wants to marry a citizen that is not the same as a refugee marrying a citizen that's point number 1 2 since you are constantly being told equal treatment we should be concerned about the people here we should always think about only the people here what is my friend's position on the uniform civil code see this obsession no no i i no, it's not an obsession no, it's no, a no, legitimate no. see, question see jumping gan wapi de do ye kar do ucc it's a matter of tumne samvidhan ke pe i raised a question on point of law you did not respond mr anas let's not idhar udhar ki baat kar rahe ho he asked you a valid question we got 20 seconds i'm asking you the constitution itself says we should give up give ourselves a uniform civil code the supreme no, court itself it is part of dpsp yes, it yes, is not yes, part sir. of fundamental right first sir, let enforced. me realize my fundamental rights that is my the sir, priority it is an objective of the constitution of no, india no no fundamental As rights are the priority of, first give sir, me that it is a directive principle you aspire towards that the state aspires for it that it is it is an ideal that we must aspire to as the constitution also upholds many other ideals to aspire to No, no, not time. I, I, you, not, I, I, you won't give me time to respond, and you please have... go ahead. One minute. See, no, you haven't even raised a question. What, what will I respond? No, I've asked you. I said, <laughs> how are you saying that this is a See, UCC is part of DPSP? I'm fighting for fundamental rights. I'm fighting for food. 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 I'm fighting And you can see the ability to oppose anybody else who's being actually right protected here. That's the simple argument. Article 12, which is okay. part of fundamental right, protects my personal right. Okay, gentlemen, you know I didn't anticipate such passion, but we we find that no, but but look, at least debate is alive in this country. So tell all those people out there that we can debate without fear or favor even the trickiest issues. in india today i leave it to this thank you very much that's right rahul and that's what makes it such a strong democracy rahul shivshankar there and our guest thank you so much to jay sai deepak and anas tanveer uh, that was indeed a very insightful and a spirited debate an amazing array of perspectives that we just heard on a very